be. Oh my gosh, it's working. Okay, so uh, we went through some other lesions, including lipid type uh, soft tissue masses and fibrous soft tissue masses. So uh, now we'll go on to the fibrohistiocytic. Uh, again, you know, this differentiation is really based upon histology uh, findings at the time more than anything else, and uh, we're not going to go through the histology here. We're really talking more, more interest in terms of the uh, MR. So here's a patient, 21-year-old male, with a back mass for five years, uh, and the pain uh, uh, went supine. Here's the MR appearance where we can see the uh, uh, bright signal, fairly sharply demarcated structure, but a lot of internal structure within the lesion, sharply demarcated. Here we can see on the axial images, has a lot of free water in it, uh, <clears throat> a little bit of increased signal intensity on the T1, which is probably kind of gray, it's kind of more like a increased uh, protonaceous type structure. Here are the PD fat sats, ultrasound, and this was a benign fibrous histiocytoma. Another lesion, here we can see sharply demarcated, looks kind of ovoid here. This is probably the deep fascia that it's associated with. Uh, <clears throat> a little inhomogeneous signal intensity uh, on the post T1 images, the coronal T1 and PD fat sat, and here we can see a little cleft in it. I uh, almost think that there could be a nerve going into this, so you could, you would, I would think if I just saw this, that this could possibly be a a uh, neurofibroma or a schwannoma, but we're not in the nerve t section here, and this turned out to be a, uh, a giant cell tumor or fibroma. And we'll talk about the distinctions which have been made in some, some papers that others don't make between a, uh, a fibroma and a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath or uh, this, it's the same histology when it's in a joint. Uh, I tend to be more of a lumper here, and they're treated the same, irrespective of, of uh, how much fibrous tissue versus stromal cells are in it. Uh, here's a 55-year-old male, status post giant cell excision six years ago, and this patient is now being evaluated for possible amputation, and here we can see this large inhomogeneous mass with a lot of low signal intensity within it, compatible with a fibrous type lesion, which you can see there. Uh, here we can see this large uh, mass also with destruction of the bone adjacent to it. And this was a recurrent uh, uh, PVNS from incomplete resection before. And they just wanted to stage it. Here's another, here's an ankle, uh, posterior mass. Uh, here you can just see a little os trigonum back there, but we have this big uh, soft tissue a lesion, it's fairly low in signal intensity on the T1 weighted image with areas of oh, very low signal intensity. And we can actually see there's an external erosion of the bone here. And uh, there's the mass, there's the erosion. Here's the axial image. We can see some inhomogeneity in it on the T2. Uh, and this is a T1 fat set pre and a T1 fat set post. And you can just see how bright this is on the T1 fat set pre. And as I've said over and over again, uh, I really feel strongly that in order to say if something's enhancing, you really have to have a T1 pre and a post. Uh, there have been some recent people who've said that, that uh, you, you only need the post, uh, but that's certainly not been my experience if you really want to see whether something's enhancing or not. So there's actually kind of minimal enhancement in this particular case, and this turned out to be PVNS also. Here we can see an extrinsic erosion of the bone here in the area where there could be tendons. We can see a soft tissue mass on the plane radiographs next to it on the MR examination. Again, we can see the low signal intensity mass, low on both the T1 and the T2 with extrinsic erosion to the bone. Here's the mass it's very much associated with the uh, tendon sheath here. And on the PD fat set, we can see that there's some uh, increased signal intensity. And that was another giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. So the very slow-growing lesions uh, will be around for a long time, well circumscribed, and they tend to mostly be in the extremities when they're associated with the tendon sheath, but that's where most tendon sheaths are located. And that's, uh, as we've seen, looks very similar. <clears throat> 
Here's, a, here's an example of another lesion associated with the tendon sheath where we can see more of a peripheral type enhancement pattern. And this was an uh, epithelioid uh, sarcoma. Uh, we usually don't get contrast enhancement. When I evaluate PVNS, that's so common. It has such a characteristic appearance. Uh, this is larger. It's a little bit more infiltrative in appearance, going kind of around the, the structures uh, than it's t typically seen with, uh, uh, with uh, PVNS. See it also extending along the tendon sheath here. Uh, certainly the contrast pattern would be somewhat atypical for uh, PVNS, but PVNS can also have inhomogeneous signal intensity. Uh, the size, uh, extent of this lesion, and I think the history on this lesion was, it, was that it was a more rapidly growing mass, whereas uh, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath is very slow growing over, as we can see, 30 to 50 years. And so it tends to come in young men, soft tissue, it's much softer in a, its t texture and palpation than uh, PVNS, and very rare compared to PVNS. 44-year-old male uh, with ankle mass, uh, excisioned at an outside clinic. Uh, we can see some soft tissue swelling, some swelling on the ultrasound. Uh, <clears throat> here we can see kind of a diffuse mass over here within the soft tissues with uptake on the PET scan. They went in and did a distal resection here. This is what the, the gross looked like. This was a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Uh, there are a lot of changes in the nomenclature for these. This, some people don't use this term anymore, but it's still in older individuals, it's one of the most common soft tissue tumors. Uh, so there are new names, pleomorphic fibrous histiocytoma or, or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but most people that I talk with still use the older term, malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Now we go on to smooth muscle lesions. Here we can see a knee, and there's this kind of uniform, sharply demarcated, relatively uniform in signal intensity on the T1, somewhat inhomogeneous signal intensity on the stir images uh, within it, but it's very sharply demarcated. And here we can see it, a little smudgy appearance on the PD fat sat. Or, I'm sorry, this is a T1 post image. And this was a Lau myoma. It looks very, uh, certainly uh, non-aggressive in its, in its appearance. 45-year-old male with a mass for only six months. This one is a much different character than the last one. It has relatively sharply demarcated smooth margins, but internal, the characteristics are much more in, in homogeneous with some fluid collecting areas and other areas that look more fibrous in, the, in nature. Uh, the enhancement pattern fits that with probably large area of either necrosis or cystic changes within it, probably necrosis, since this sounds like it's a fairly rapidly growing tumor. Other areas of enhancement, we can see it on the sagittal, and this was a Laumau sarcoma. So it really has a much more aggressive appearance to it uh, and a more aggressive history. And we'll see some others of those in other locations. Yes? Uh, I had a question about these uh, smooth muscle-based tumors. Where exactly are they arising from? Is it sort of that fibroblast derivative or, or originer, or is it there some other kind well, of cell there? In the where are the smooth muscle cells at that these are arising from? In the skin, they're probably in the organelles in the skin, uh, such as the hair follicles. Uh, that have smooth muscle within them uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you also have smooth muscle inside the skin, uh, which is in involved with, uh, uh, with dimpling the skin sometimes when you get cold in, in response to, to temperature. And then skeletal muscle, here's a 27-year-old female with a thigh mass, again, fairly sharply demarcated, in this case, relatively uniform with some areas of inhomogeneity on the T1-weighted image and what looks like maybe a little fibrous band or a low-signal band within it, a little bit more inhomogeneous with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with the proton density sequence and the T2 fat set and the T1 fat set images. <clears throat> 
uh, with contrast. And this was an alveolar soft part sarcoma. Uh, they tend to be vascular masses. <coughs> And there's a big differential on these, so uh, as you can imagine, and as we all know, MR is not very specific when it comes to making a uh, tissue diagnosis in these conditions. MR is primarily for detecting and staging uh, these kind of lesions. Here's a four-year-old male, leg swelling and fever, uh, left posterior thigh swelling and fever for one week. And here, uh, here we can see markers overlying where a, a mass and the swelling is located. Here we can see the increased signal intensity. This really feathers out into the surrounding soft tissues. Certainly just looking at this, if they had the right history, I'd be concerned about an infection in this location, but you could also be a muscle tear looking like this. And here we can see, again, a little bit inhomogeneous, not as sharply demarcated as some of the others. There's the ultrasound, a little bit of vascularity in it. This is the post-contrast images showing now this looks much more like an enhancing mass uh, after the contrast. And this was an alveolar abdominal sarcoma. M much more aggressive appearance than the more benign lesions. Five-year-old male with left buttock swelling for one month. And here we can see a mass. Again, this one's relatively sharply demarcated around the margins. Looks like there's some vascularity going into it, but inhomogeneity within it on the PD fat sat images, uh, <coughs> as well as the PD images. Again, inhomogeneity. Looks like areas of either fluid or uh, necrosis within the lesion. A very avid PET uptake, and this was an embryonal cell rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. There's pretty uh, pretty uncommon. That's and then we can go to the vascular uh, tumors. Uh, here's a typical lollipop appearance of a, <coughs> of a uh, popliteal artery aneurysm. There you can see the nice arterial structure here uh, with the large aneurysm. Often you get kind of an onion skinning because you get uh, various uh, layers of uh, clot formation within these. Tip often in the center you can see, uh, especially on the axial images, flow where there's still viable flow with the, with the clot surrounding it. So that's a popliteal artery aneurysm. I'll show a number of different examples of their characteristic appearances. Uh, <clears throat> and just always remember around the knee, if someone has a true knee dislocation, not just a patellar dislocation, be very be carefully evaluate the uh, uh, artery uh, posteriorly in the popliteal area for, for injury because you can get pseudoaneurysms after that. Here we can see a uh, typical appearance. The margins are very lobulated of this lesion. We can see a flebolith within it. We can see fat extending uh, uh, within the lesion, the incepta within the lesion. This is classic of, uh, of a venous type uh, vascular malformation. Here we can see the nice flebolis. So when you see these, I like to get a plain film just to correlate and, and see the typical appearing flebolis. And we typically call these hemangioma. Uh, and this particular pattern is really a, a venous malformation, but often called hemangioma. Some people, as I think we'll talk about in a minute, uh, <coughs> like to divide the vascular lesions into low flow lesions, which would be capillary malformations, venous malformation, lymphatic, and, and a mixed variety of those. And there's some criteria that we'll talk about trying to differentiate the lymphangiomas from the others. And then the high flow, which really are the AV malformations. And you can typically see the difference on MR because you can see a focal knot a flow void on the AVMs, and obviously these two are going to be treated very differently. Uh, and they, a lot of people like to differentiate those from tr what they consider true vascular tumors, uh, which hemangioma would be in, where you see a lot of endothelial proliferation and some others that are very rare. The common parlance, however, is not to use hemangioma for these uh, endothelial tumors, but to use hemangioma for all these low flow states, especially the ones that aren't lymphatic. So it gets a little bit confusing. 
uh, <coughs> but the common terminology would be for the for the capillary and venous malformations also to be called hemangioma. <coughs> so when you see low flow uh, malformation, you tend to not see any uh, signal voids. You don't see any AV shunting. Uh, you get more of a libulated mass, just like we saw. Commonly contains fat within it, which is uncommon for other lesions, certainly for malignant lesions, uh, except for uh, uh, liposarcomas. You get fluid lakes, but if you have a lot of fluid lakes, if you have a lot of f uh, what looks like puddles of water within it, then it's more likely to be a lymphatic in origin, and most likely a, a lymphangioma, if that's the case. Now, obviously, flebolis can be very helpful for the venous malformation type. If you do uh, MR uh, 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 arteriogram uh, rapidly, really looking for perfusion, MR perfusion study, then you really should have a very rapid rise time under, uh, under a minute. Uh, and then with the lymphatic, you get a lot of uh, unenhancing voids. High flow lesions, you typically have signal voids, you have a spinal mass of vessels with typically a central area that they come out of. Uh, <coughs> uh, you do not have an enhancing mass, and you have a very rapid rise time because you have AV shunting if you evaluate it. Yeah. So here's another lesion. Here we can see some fluid levels. Uh, see a lot of prominent uh, uh, pooling of uh, fluid within this particular lesion. Here we can see it's kind of a lobulated appearance. We don't see a lot of fat within it, but we have all this pooling of, of fluid. Uh, this was a hemangioma. Most of the time in a situation like this, I would certainly raise the question that it could be a lymphangioma because of all the fluid that's in it. Two-year-old female, mass and uh, lesion in the right buttock and posterior thigh, for only noted for one week, but you can see there's a lot of asymmetry here, so my guess is it's been more than a week, no uptake on the bone scan. Uh, and here we can see this lesion, uh, fat sat T2 with a lot of low signal intensity regions in it. The T1, we can see what looks like a lot of fat with it within the lesion in different areas. GAD, kind of an inhomogeneous enhancement. Here's the lesion in the gross specimen, turned out to be a cavernous hemangioma with areas of hematoma uh, within it and, and thrombi. You know, just looking at this like this, I would be more concerned uh, that it would be a uh, 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 li uh, liposarcoma uh, with this kind of fat w within the lesion, though these little, having these little nodules would be a little bit uncommon. Uh, but in a young kid, uh, malformations you always have to think about, and this would be a vascular malformation. Fat in it. Here's a lesion on 8105. You can see a little bit of fat around it, but it's a young kid with still the physes are intact. We can see it's primarily a low signal mass, a little bit of lobulated margins on the uh, uh, stir images. We can also see the lobulated margins in areas that may be flebolis with focal low signal intensity within it. A little bit of homogeneous here. And here, if we get the plain film, we can see all these different flebolis lists within it. So this again, and this is now a few years later, where on a high field scanner, we can see the margins much better on, at high field. You can see the flebolis lists very nicely. This is also a more mature person and a more mature lesion, as we can see there, axial images. Notice also that this has grown as the patient's aged, and this was an enlarging hemangioma in a child. Nine-year-old female, right thigh focal swelling for seven years. A little inhomogeneous on the, on the uh, MR. Here we can see a lot of fat extending into this particular lesion. Uh, kind of the margins are a little bit indistinct in that sense, though they're s very sharp. The, the anatomy is very sharply delineated here, so the zone of transition is, a, is narrow, but it's still very serpiginous, irregular margins of this particular lesion. And here we can see it also in the axial areas. And this was a, a lymphangioma. The other thing that can look like this that we'll talk about later are plexiform neurofibroma with this inhomogeneous pattern. And it really looks like they're 
kind of things gr growing into it with kind of fingers are out on the periphery. So uh, this also could well be a plexiform neural fibroma, and we'll see some examples of those later as, as well. And this is just a review of the malformations that we just talked about. 52-year-old female with decades-old mass and increasing, with, which is increasing in pain for two years. There we can see uh, a lot of mass, with a lot of enhancement and large area of uh, lack of enhancement. Again, makes you think about a lymphangioma when you see that with this kind of a history, large area that doesn't enhance, and this was a lymphangioma. 25-year-old male little pockets of vascularity within a lesion, and here we can see a nice, probably a draining vein. This lesion, fairly sharply demarcated with some uh, uh, scalloping of the margins and some septa within it. Here we can see it on the axial images. Certainly looks vascular. And this was an intramuscular venous malformation. 15-year-old palpable mass right arm. Uh, known for one month, 10 years ago. Uh, mass was incised at the same site. And here we can see the lesion. Also kind of scallop margins in homogeneous enhancement. So again, scallop margins, fat extending into it in sept kind of a septal appearance. And this was a papillary endothelial hyperplasia. Again, a benign type tumor, also called Maison's tumor. Sixty-eight-year-old male, left-hand mass. As you can see, projecting over the fourth and fifth metacarpophalangeal joints. Here's the lesion on an MR examination. Uh, <coughs> very inhomogeneous in its characteristics. This is angiomyoma. 41 female with palpable mass. Again, we can see the mass very nicely. It looks like it's adjacent to a vessel and some of the septa. Ultrasound, kind of a lentiform shape. Vascularity around the mass. Looks like maybe some draining vessels. That's what it looked like in gross. And this was a venous sarcoma. 'n the, the next set of uh, category uh, are parasitic lesions. One of the more common ones is this particular lesion. You can see kind of a uniform signal intensity, very sharply demarcated lesion, and a typical appearance involving the uh, distal phalanx and the soft tissues adjacent to it here. You kind of uniform high signal intensity on T2 weighted images with a kind of a thickened capsule around it. And this is a typical appearance of a globus tumor in this location. Uh, <coughs> here's kind of the anatomy of the nail bed here distally. And uh, you can have a number of subungual tumors in this location, a globus tumor being the most common. Uh, you can get a subungual exostosis, and I'll show some examples of those when we get to the hand section. Soft tissue chondroma, very similar. And then uh, hemangioma, cystic lesion, epidermoid cysts, and mucoid cysts, which we'll see in some of the uh, further lectures. Uh, malignant lesions in this location are very uncommon. You can get squamous cell carcinomas and melanomas, but they're very, very uncommon. 32-year-old male, pain for a year. See what may be a soft tissue mass there. Here we can see a kind of a spiculated type mass over here with very irregular margins. A lot of kind of round cells through it, and this was a glomus tumor. So, uh, yeah, typically occur in young adults. Most are benign, some are, some are malignant. Now, here's an another tumor. Uh, this was uh, and a, a young adult who presented at, at this particular stage. This is a typical location for lesions that we've, we've talked about in the, in the knee section, where you can get avulsion injuries of the gastrocnemius insertions to the bone here, 
with hypertrophic bone formation at that location, typically in young kids. This is a little bit older than that. But this has a different characteristic. This has a lot more fluid within it. Uh, the margins are very irregular, and it doesn't really look like a typical avulsion lesion uh, of the tendinous insertion on the bone, but really more mass effect. And if we go to the axial images, we can see that it's, it really doesn't have, whenever we've seen lesions, which are tug-type lesions, they've, they've been very uniform uh, without speculated margins like this. You don't really see edema out in the soft tissues unless you completely avulse, avulse it off. And this really has more kind of a speculated margin. Uh, this was an initially, however, uh, called a cortical desmoid, uh, but it turned out to be a hemangial endothelioma very malignant lesion, and the patient died about four months after the diagnosis was made. Uh, the treatment was delayed about two months because of the original uh, call. I don't really think it would make much difference. These are very uh, deadly lesions. <laughs> but just remember, and I, I, when we get to the knee sections, I'll show a couple of other malignant lesions in this particular location. I hope those will be the only ones you'll ever see because they're very rare there, and cortical desmoids or avulsion injuries there are common. You see them all the time, especially in kids. So I don't want you to say, can't rule out hemangioendothelioma when you see those, but the benign ones, the, the lesion, they're characteristic enough where I don't think you have to bring up malignancy because you'll, you'll scare a lot of people if you bring up malignancy, but we'll talk about those when we get to the knee section. Then the chondroosseous lesions, a uh, 39-year-old male, slow-growing right ankle mass. Here we can see the mass right here. Uh, sharply demarcated. Kind of has some septa in it. Fairly uniform in signal intensity, though, in the different sequences. Uh, <clears throat> and this was a chondroba uh, adjacent to the bones. They tend to produce extrinsic erosions of the bone when they occur next to a bone. But they, they really look like cartilage uh, on the MR examination. Some recent images, and here's a, another. This is later on. This is a couple of years after it's grown, and you can see a peripheral enhancement, but mostly just a, a enhancing uniform mass of cartilage, which is externally uh, rotting the bone. And this, actually, this one was a chondrosarcoma, so a little bit more aggressive appearance to it. 18-year-old female, left foot mass, and here we can see the mass here in the plantar aspect, fairly low signal intensity, a little bit inhomogeneous in its characteristics. This turned out to be an extra skeletal chondroma that was low in signal intensity. If we go back here, probably because of, mostly probably because it has a lot of fibrous tissue and it may be a little bit of poorly defined calcification, but probably mostly fibrous. 40-year-old female, palpable mass in the right inguinal area for 11 years, recently enlarging. So here we can see this mass, again, fairly a little bit scallop margins, fairly sharply defined, but internal characteristics with a lot of internal septa and inhomogeneity. See mass effect on the vessels. <coughs> this was an exoskeletal mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Not a lot of vessels in it. 68-year-old female with a shoulder mass was recently excised at a, at a clinic. Here we can see the the area here on the MR, a little focal high signal intensity area, fairly uniform. This was also an extraskeletal, and this, this was an extraskeletal osteosarcoma. So extraskeletal osteosarcomas are pretty uncommon lesions. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the x-ray before it was excised. They typically are ossified. Uh, with uh, central ossification with the mass around it, a much larger mass than the area where you see calcification on them, as you would expect. Again, pretty uncommon lesions. Another lesion where we really see a lot of low signal intensity within it, really looks like ossification or calcification on the, on the MR. On the, on the CT, though, we just see a soft tissue mass, so there's not uh, uh, ossification. Uh, we don't actually see uh, os uh, ossicle within it, but this is the the, the uh, soft tissue uh, os uh, osteosarcoma. Oh. And the neurogenic tumors are a more common tumor that we'll see. 
looks like a nice eyeball here with the optic nerve and the uh, and the uh -huh. lens here. But actually, we've got optic nerves coming out of both ends, which would be a little bit atypical for an eyeball. And then if we go to the sagittal image, it's also an abnormal location for an eyeball, being in the popliteal fossa. And this is just a large uh, perineural cyst. And this is a perineural cyst of the tibial nerve. We'll see more about perineural cysts uh, if you are near joints, especially uh, around the knee. Uh, if you, you can have ganglion cysts coming out of joints, especially the proximal tibial fibrillar joint, which can extend into the, uh, uh, into the nerve and actually dissect up through the nerves. Uh, uh, and we'll see some examples of that. Fairly uncommon, but pretty dramatic when you see it. Uh, this patient who presented with a perineal, uh, per perineal nerve palsy, you see a big cystic mass on the ultrasound, and here we can see this mass extending up, and if you followed it, it actually goes along the course of the nerve. Uh, here we can see it posteriorly here. Here's a dissection of the lesion, and this was a ganglion cyst uh, that extended into and follows along the sciatic nerve. Sturm is sewing a uh, 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 mass uh, between the third and fourth uh, metatarsophalangeal joints. And here, typical appearance of a Morton's neuroma. And here's a patient you know, on the other side who had two of them, both very painful. Uh, this patient had bilateral Morton's neuroma. And uh, the female, and she liked wearing high heel shoes, which is a common finding here. It's the pressure that uh, produces uh, uh, injury to the interdigital nerve, and uh, as you all know, these are these aren't really true neuromas. These are traumatic injuries to the nerve, and this is all scar formation, hypertrophic scar formation, which tends to be uh, very heavily innervated and therefore very tender. You excise them? What? What are the treatments for Yeah, the treatment is you excise them. You, you just re remove the mass, and uh, the symptoms markedly improve because you no longer have that big tender mass that's being traumatized between the bones. Do you lose the nerve then? Yes. Now, you can get these kind of lesions elsewhere. Here we can see a big mass back here that's actually very longitudinal here. This is, this is the mass. So you can really see it looks like it's along the, tr tr I'm sorry, here it is. Uh, and if you go down, you can see that there's denervation atrophy of the uh, muscles of the calf, which are innervated by this nerve. And this is a fibrolipomatous hamartoma of the posterior tibial nerve. Uh, these are much more common in the wrist, as you're all familiar with. Uh, I think these are traumatic injuries of the nerve uh, where you get, uh, this is all really scar tissue uh, from where you get repetitive trauma. And the wrist, it's really the flexor retinaculum that does the trauma. Here we can see uh, another, what looks like a peripheral nerve tumor with a nerve coming out of it here. Pretty typical appearance of a schwannoma. Kind of a smudgy center area on the uh, stir or PD fat sat images. And this was a posterior tibial nerve schwannoma. 47 year old female with the right thigh mass for three months. There we can see the mass markedly inhomogeneous. Maybe a little high signal intensity on the T1-weighted images. And we can see it in the thigh area. A little bit of uptake on the PET. Biopsy, there's the mass removed, as you can see there. A lot of, much more inhomogeneity on the gross specimen. Large areas of hemorrhage and uh, uh, some breakdown, internal breakdown, different areas had different pathology, and this was a large schwannoma in the thigh. 43-year-old male who has a large buttock mass, which you can see here. Uh, there again, ultrasound, and this is a neural lymphoma. Here's a mass along the tibia here, much more inhomogeneous, margins much less distinct than the other tumors we've bis just been seeing, uh, almost a little bit like it's infiltrative into the uh, subcutaneous fat. There we can see it up here. 
and this was a ganglioneuroma. It was benign, but it had a more aggressive growth pattern than most peripheral nerve sheath tumor, nerve tumors. It's not a nerve sheath, it's a nerve tumor. 56-year-old lower back pain for one year. You can see uh, marked in homogeneity there. Lesions in the skull. This was a paraganglionoma. And obviously this patient didn't do real well. Otherwise it would be a little hard to get these images. Thigh mass, notice how markedly inhomogeneous this is with uh, very uh, irregular margins. And then here again, markedly inhomogeneous with the, looks like fingers kind of extending out from it. And look at all the thickened septa in through here. Now we're in the neuro section. So uh, this was a plexiform neurofibroma. 53 year old female, right foot pain and swelling for 10 days after an excisional biopsy. But here we can see this big mass with inhomogeneous enhancement inhomogeneous signal on the T1 weighted image. Other lesions in around the sacrum and spine. Lesion here involving the nerve. Uh, when, we, when we get to the rest of the sections, we'll do more as unknowns. I'm just kind of going through, giving an overall kind of list of what different lesions look like. And this was neurofibromatosis with neurofibroma everywhere. And here are the findings. And we'll talk a little bit more about these in specific when we get to the specific section. 25-year-old female with enlarging mass here and within the skin. Again, this kind of irregularity of the margins, really kind of following along the skin, a huge lesion. And look at all this kind of, uh, kind of finger-like projections at the edge of the lesion and it kind of almost looks kind of like a striated appearance to the lesion. And here are the vessels going into it on the ultrasound, where you can also see that same striation. This was a uh, uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And you're all familiar with neurofibromatosis, the different ones. One is you get localized neurofibroma, this is the one where you get the plexiform neurofibroma with much more of the complex patterns that we've been looking at and diffuse neurofibroma. And there's another example of plexiform neurofibromatosis, this time in the, in the sacrum from neurofibromatosis 1, more of a diffuse form of plexiform disease. Again, uh, 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 <coughs> trying to differentiate those from the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor can be difficult. Size can be somewhat helpful, but there are a lot of plexiform neurofibroma that are larger than five centimeters. The non-plexiform ones tend not to be, but we saw that huge uh, schwannoma that they removed from the buttocks. But generally, most places, people don't wait till they're that big before they remove them and take care of them. Uh, so they tend to be much more slow growing than the malignant variety. You tend to get more peripheral enhancement, heterogeneous signal intensity on T1 because of hemorrhage. You get necrosis and hemorrhage internally, paralesional edema, and then you get cystic components that you don't get in other, lesion, in other peripheral nerve lesions. 23-year-old fem female, aggr aggravated calf swelling for several weeks, very inhomogeneous uh, picture here. <coughs> and again, and this is a huge lesion extending way down here, so this, this really, with markedly inhomogeneous sections within the lesion. This really looks like it's more of a malignant type thing. And this was hemorrhage inside of a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And then uh, getting to one of the later categories, marrow and immune origin diseases. 32-year-old female with palpable chest wall mass for one month. And you see the mass here on ultrasound with some uh, vascularity into it. Here we can see the lesion on an MR examination. And uh, this is Castleman's disease, <coughs> which is uh, let's see. It's really uh, lymphoid hyperplasia. 
and there's, there are a number of different types, but you can get just large lymph nodes throughout the body. And it's really, uh, as it says here, some people believe it's a low-grade inflammatory process or at least some sort of a abnormal lymphoid reaction to something. It tends to be in the thorax. 75-year-old female, see a mass in the popliteal area. Looks like it may be extending proximally, some vascularity adjacent to it. And this is neurolymphomatosis. So here you actually have uh, lymphoma infiltrating the tibial nerve back here. Multiple palpable masses in uh, both calves. See the lesions on ultrasound. Here we can see other lesions uh, going down. Lesions within the skeletal system. And this was lymphoma. 81 year old male left upper arm mass for two months. Double size in 10 days. That's what the mass looks like. And here we can see the mass on x-ray and on MR examination, large mass extending out and really going through the dermis. Huge mass here in the retroperitoneum. This again was lymphoma. And then we can talk about some dermatologic masses. <laughs> Uh, here we can see a mass in the subcutaneous tissues, and uh, ultrasound. Yeah, you really need a plain film for this because you need to see the calcification, and this is really benign calcification within the dermis, probably post-traumatic, probably trauma with hematoma formation. Then you get kind of uh, calcified uh, soft tissue mass. 68-year-old male with a growing mass, which we can see here also within the dermis, very inhomogeneous, and this was a malignant melanoma. And one of the things that you can see in these, uh, that I should have pointed out before I gave the diagnosis, in fact, uh, is you can see areas of increased signal intensity. So you get an x-ray, and the x-ray does not show calcification. It doesn't have a typical appearance, so, but you think this could wait, maybe be diffuse hemorrhage within the lesion. But the other thing to remember is it could be melanin, because melanin can be bright on a T1-weighted image. And there have been a couple of cases where we've actually made the initial diagnosis on MR in some cases here, and you'll see those cases later if I don't have it uh, right away, uh, because of that signal characteristic within the lesion on T1-weighted images. So I think it's really very important that you get a true T1-weighted image whenever you evaluate soft tissue lesions. I, I like them in every MR. Uh, at least one T1-weighted image. And then some of uncertain etiology. 61-year-old uh, uh, male with four-year history of a leg mass. Here we can see what looks like kind of a cystic, sharply circumscribed mass here within the, the uh, calf muscles on a CT examination. No enhancement on CT. And that was a myxoma within the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, uh, most of these myxomas are actually malignant lesions, even though they, they look fairly benign. It's one of those lesions which uh, uh, the imaging characteristics can fool you. Do they typically enhance at all? Uh, they typically don't enhance much. Okay. Sometimes you can get a rim enhancement. Often you'll get septi in them that enhance. But uh, you can, get, you can get these around the knee, in the soft tissues around the knee, where it looks like kind of a multi-septated cyst. Uh, fortunately, they tend, I've never seen them occur where we typically get those cysts at the gastrocnemius insertions. Typically, the ones I've seen have been in Hoffa's fat pad. Uh, but muscles, they're much more common in muscles. 50-year-old female, uh, really had an incidental finding here, this mass. Adjacent to the scapula, inhomogeneous, markedly inhomogeneous enhancement. 
There's the lesion at Gross, and that was also an intramuscular myxoma. Soft tissue myxomas, uh, true medical neoplasm, uh, undifferentiated stellate cells, slow growing, often painful, intramuscular thigh. And can, they can also present like uh, myxoid liposarcomas. Here's an example around the knee where we can see <coughs> this uh, sharply subscribed cystic kind of mass with all these septa in them. And you can see how it's replacing Hoffa's fat pad, the fat and Hoffa's fat pad. And this was also a myxoid tumor that upon resection was thought to be malignant, but the, the patient did well with a wide resection. Another lesion of indeterminate uh, origin. Here we can see a mass which is eroding bones. And when in the foot, this is a, one of the characteristic locations for this particular lesion. And this was a synovial sarcoma. They can look very cystic if, you, if you're not careful. They can be fairly uniform and low signal intensity on the T1, bright on the T2, but they tend not to be, not to be as low in signal as typical fluid or as bright as typical fluid on the T2 images. And when you enhance, they typically uh, enhance inhomogeneously, but relatively uniformly, except when they're large lesions, and these tend to grow rapidly, and they tend to uh, necrose centrally, and they get a hemorrhagic necrosis centrally. So one of the things was found out very early on in papers that were looking at soft tissue masses is that uh, one of the false negatives for MR was some people called what they thought were hematomas in the musculoskeletal system hematomas, and in reality they were turned out to be highly malignant synovial sarcomas. This is just an example. Here we can see a markedly irregular mass, uh, which on the T1-weighted image is very bright because of the met hemoglobin within it on T2. We can see uh, irregular margins, but kind of an, the edges are thick and rind if you actually look at this, see this is all soft tissue tumor, and it's not uniform, it's nodular, it's very thickened, and not of uniform thickness, and this is typical of a necrotic mass. And here's that same lesion, coronal T1-weighted image. Notice that the thickened rind of tissue around the area that looks like the hematoma. The other thing that you can see in synovial sarcomas, when they're allowed to get large, they tend to involve both sides of a joint, uh, like this, but they don't actually involve the joint itself. They're a misnomer. They're, they do not come from synovial tissues. The tissue of origin is unknown on these, and this is a synovial sarcoma. 65-year-old female with a knee mass. Can I see some little soft tissue here. And then here we can see mass here in the Mid portion of the knee, somewhat inhomogeneous on a T2 weighted image, and this was a clear cell sarcoma. Uh, the very unusual lesion, but when you look at it, it's inhomogeneous in signal intensity, and really just is, is kind of just uh, forgetting soft tissue planes and just kind of growing centrally from a location. Margins are very indistinct on the T2 weighted image, very inhomogeneous. Uh, typical of a malignant type lesion. 16 year old female with a soft tissue mass. Here we can see it in the thigh. Very, a lot of septa in it, but a lot of high signal intensity in those on the T1 weighted image. Very inhomogeneous, really kind of like a bag of balls, like a lot of uh, <coughs> very inhomogeneous on the PD. And then here we can see METS to the lung. And this was a soft tissue Ewing sarcoma. 38-year-old male with the left thigh mass, another big mass here, epidermoid inclusion cyst. We'll see most of these in the hands when we get to the hands, and this is due to kind of stabbing injury where the epiderm epidermal cells get lodged deep to, deep to the dermis, and then they kind of then continue to grow there as a mass. 29-year-old slow-growing mass, markedly inhomogeneous uh, with uh, some edema, adjacent to it, maybe some fluid levels, certainly a lot of uh, inhomogeneous tissues there, maybe not. And this was a oh. soft tissue aneurysmal bone cyst. How could it be a bone thing? cyst in the soft 
as well, much as the hematoma. I, I guess it's possibly there could have been a hematoma that calcified and then ossified, <laughs> or it could be just some uh, some sort of parenchymal abnormal cells that abnormally uh, de-differentiate and redifferentiate in the soft tissues. I don't know. It's a very rare lesion, but uh, they do occur. <laughs> Here, young woman with joint stiffness. Here we can see all these calcifications within the muscle all over the place. And this was sister sarcosis. And uh, they are like little rice grains. Okay, so that's really an overview of soft tissue masses. And then uh, we'll dive into a little bit more deeply in future talks. Now, future talks will be less like lectures, and there will be more case presentations. Because uh, uh, I think n these lesions tend not to be very characteristic, as you can see on an MR examination. Uh, but when you see a bunch of them, you can get a kind of a sense of how significant they're going to be, even though you can't really reliably put them in proper histologic buckets. But I think by going through and seeing more of those and, and, and seeing instead of just one of each one like, like we just talked about, but seeing kind of the spectrum uh, of how a number of them looks like over the next few weeks, uh, we'll, we'll try to get a better sense of, uh, of soft tissue masses. But again, we're primarily detecting the masses and determining their, uh, their extent on an MR examination. Now, tomorrow I'll be out of town, and Thursday I have to be over at Tower doing research. So uh, I think maybe at this time, why don't we have our next talk a week from today, uh, uh, a week on Monday, okay? All right, thanks, everyone. Any questions? Yeah? Thanks, Dr. Chris. Okay. See everybody in a week. Thanks. Bye.